We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who've served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item for tonight is our agenda. Uh, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? Uh, there are none. Hearing none, uh, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. We have an agenda for the evening. Our next item is our selection of speakers. <laughs> this Aislinn's coming over. <laughs> Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at tonight's uh, meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers during, public, during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. Ms. Bratt. One. The first is James Chen. Two. <coughs> Number two is Sheila Brown. Number three is Ying Lin. Four. Number four is Shuli Jia. Five. Number five is Steve Weber. Six. Six is Erica Ma. Seven. Number seven is Pat Holt. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So when we get to our... No, I'm, I'm sorry, we, are, we do stick to our policies just to be fair to everyone, so we'll stick with our seven tonight. Thank you. All right, our um, next item is a special order of biz, uh, business, a recognition of our Blue Ribbon Schools. For that, I'd like to invite Dr. Dance and Mr. Gillis up uh, for our recognition. Our uh, first school to be recognized, Blue Ribbon School to be recognized this evening is George Washington Carver uh, School for the Arts and Technology. Accepting uh, our award this evening is Ms. Karen Steele, the principal. Oh, accepting for Ms. Karen Steele, <laughs> the principal is Mr. John O'Brien, the assistant principal. In addition to Mr. O'Brien, members of the leadership team are here, Ms. Laurie Brewer, Duncan Clements, Maggie Fitzsimmons, Allison Haley, Lynn Kinnear, Mike Loverd, Loverd, and Olivia Ginsky, who we just uh, saw as uh, leading the Pledge of Allegiance. So if those would come up, we'll uh, begin our recognition. All right, I'd like to uh, present this resolution to George Washington Carver School. It reads, whereas George Washington Carver Center for the Arts and Technology Education has been named a 2016 National Blue Ribbon School. And whereas Carver Center for the Arts and Technology was joined in this honor by Hereford High School, which was also named a 2016 National Blue Ribbon School, and these two schools now join the roster of the 20 other county schools that have earned this rare honor. 
and these schools collectively represent the potential of every Baltimore County school to ensure that all students graduate globally competitive. And whereas Carver Center is a country, countywide magnet high school with specialized programs in acting, dance, carpentry, cosmetology, culinary arts, design and production for technical theater, information technology, interactive media production, literary, literary and visual arts, and whereas the school's high school assessment and SAT scores remain above county, state, and national averages, and whereas Carver, George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology has received many national honors, including a National Magnet School of Distinction, John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts National School of Distinction, and Art School Network's Outstanding School. This recognition for George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology brings attention to the strength of the school's administrative and academic leadership, the quality, dedication, and creativity of its teachers, the enthusiasm and abilities of its students, and the unwavering support the school receive, receives from involved parents and community partners now Therefore, it be resolved so that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on the 25th day of October in the year 2016 expresses gratitude and sincere appreciation to the entire staff, student body, and community of George Washington Carver Center for the Arts and Technology for their hard work, foresight, vision, and extraordinary efforts in achieving this milestone. This resolution is signed Charles McDaniels, Chair, S. Dallas Stance, Secretary Treasurer. Congratulations. Our next recognition goes to Hereford High School. Uh, this evening we have Mr. Joe Jira, principal, uh, and his following team members, Emily Book, John Billingsley, William Brown, John Paul Babard, Jamie Higgins Shaw, Shelley Powers, Tracy Hanley, and William Halagata. If they would come forward at this time, we would uh, appreciate that. resolution reads as follows. Whereas Hereford High School has been named a 2016 National Blue Ribbon School, and whereas Hereford High School was joined in this honor by George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology, which was also named a 2016 National Blue Ribbon School, and whereas these schools these two schools now join the roster of 20 other county schools that have earned this rare honor. And these schools collectively re represent the potential of every Baltimore County school to ensure that all students graduate globally competitive. And whereas Hereford High School is regularly ranked among the best high schools in the nation, and additionally each year 600 students take more than 1,000 advanced placement exams, and whereas the school, in addition to its regular academic program, is known for its outstanding music, art, and business programs, 
And whereas this recognition for Hereford High School brings attention to the strength of the school's administrative and academic leadership, the quality, dedication, and creativity of its teachers, the enthusiasm of it, uh, and abilities of its students, and the unwavering support the school receives from involved parents and community partners, now therefore it be resolved that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on this 25th day of October in the year 2016 expresses gratitude and sincere appreciation to the entire staff, student body, and community of Hereford High School for their hard work, foresight, vision, and extraordinary efforts in achieving this milestone. And again, this is signed Charles McDaniels and S. Dallas Dance. Uh, from the board. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. So Congratulations. Our next item for the evening is public comment. This is one of the opportunities we provide to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your marks when you hear the bell or see that time has uh, expired. <clears throat> this time we'll hear from our advisory stakeholder groups uh, to start with. The first being uh, from the Baltimore County Student Council, Ms. Jordan Wilson. She's got a posse with her. <laughs> so it's not just me today. A couple of people yeah. joining me if you guys introduce yourselves. Hello guys, I am Tiffany Klingenstein. I am a senior in Eastern Tech and I'm the Vice President of Baltimore County Student Councils. Hi, my name is Carter Bohart. I go to Pine Grove Middle School. I am second Vice President. And I'm Jordan. Um, so we just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you who just uh, joined us on our dinner. Um, we love getting the opportunity to be able to sit down with the board and talk about whatever we feel is important. And we love that you guys take the time out of your day to actually listen to us and to consider our feedback. Uh, so we had a great discussion today about the grading policy, our thoughts on it, as well as a couple other topics. Um, so we just want to say a huge, huge thank you to you guys. We can't wait to kind of continue that conversation within the next couple months. Um, and then just thank you for considering the opinions of the students. Uh, it really does mean a lot to us. So thank you all very much. Thank you. And I would just like to say from the board publicly, we want to thank the student council so much for the very uh, important and enlightening info information that we received earlier. So please continue to communicate with us. And thank you. Thank you all. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Abby Baton, president of TABCO.
Good evening. Good evening. Chairman McDaniels, <clears throat> Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Danson, members of the board. TAPCO has been sharing concerns and difficulties as well as positive feedback with BCPS officials since the pilot began this year. Our teachers have offered suggestions to help with the problems they have identified. I have heard from many teachers who are in agreement with the concept of mastery grading, but are overwhelmed by the additional workload associated with the pilot guidelines and the technology supporting those guidelines. <laughs> Yesterday morning, the Grading and Reporting Steering Committee met for the first time this year. There were teachers, including myself, principals, parents, and BCPS administration and staff in the room. The students who were supposed to attend were not able to be there, unfortunately. But we did discuss at length ways to improve the pilot to make it easier for the teachers to use, easier for parents and students to understand, and to make the changes as soon as possible. We were pleased that the outcomes from the committee are going to be put into place quickly and shared directly with the teachers. We all agreed that this is just the first step in moving forward, but clearly will not resolve all of the existing difficulties. Most of the teachers understand the need for changes to the grading system. The issue, as always, has been the implementation of those changes. While I have continually discussed the need for light, lightening the teacher workload, this implementation has added to that workload. The teachers simply need more time to plan and more items taken off their platters. We are hopeful that as more and more changes are put into place, we will have a truly workable model for our students, parents, and teachers that will help everyone understand student progress and needs moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, P.J. Schaefer. Mr. Schaefer, good evening. Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board, thank you. Uh, I want to start off, actually, uh, I've heard from teachers as well, um, some of my son's past teachers from middle school, some of his current teachers, um, along with, with, with what Mitt Spaten had just said, um, teachers are struggling with the workload. They're struggling with that workload, and it goes along with what I'm about to say, but I, it's not just from TABCO that you, that, that you should be hearing that. Um, I want to start off with a compliment. My son um, is, is currently at Newtown High School. He is taking a combination of courses. He's taking courses in the classroom. Um, he's also taking some of the e-learning classes um, online. And that combination is really working. And I wanted to compliment the, the e-learning and the um, uh, office, as well as Baltimore County for, for really increasing that opportunity for so many students with special needs and IEPs. Um, the ability to take classes both in the classroom as well as anywhere there's a computer hookup is really benefiting students when home in hospital, on students who, for whatever reason, have um, illnesses like my son, who misses class often, but is able to make it up. Um, it, having that flexibility of scheduling, to be able to log on and take a class in the evening, or log on and take a class um, you know, beyond, uh, over the weekend, or times when normal classes aren't in session is really benefiting all of our students, both, both regular ed as well as special ed. And I think that th there needs to be a compliment paid there. Um, along those lines, however, um, I do want to point out uh, one of the weaknesses. At the moment, and again, it, the e-learning office is only it's in its second year, um, but at the moment there's not a lot of special ed support for the Office of E-Learning because, again, the regular ed teachers teaching regular ed classes and oftentimes students with IEPs who may be taking those courses need the curriculum modified. So along with, again, with, with my, what Ms. Baton was just saying, um, there needs to be support and, and our teachers are struggling with, with ways to get that support and curriculum modification. Um, the Office of Special Ed has asked to be able to place a staff member into the e-learning. The o Office of Special Ed has asked for be, to be able to be, place um, staff members into the curriculum writing to help scaffold that curriculum. And that will not just help 
the special ed students, that really helps all of the students. When there's, when there's scaffolding of the curriculum to allow students to sort of build their way up to be successful, um, that really benefits all students. So I, I'm here today, again, like I said, to, to pay a compliment for really expanding the number of courses available. Uh, but I also wanted to say that additional work needs to be done. We'd ask for that support to be placed in this particular office. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. <clears throat> Our next uh, speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, uh, ESPBC, uh, Lila Marinbloom. Good evening. Good evening. I am Lila Ma <laughs> That was okay. great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am Lila Marenblum. I am the president of the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. Our bargaining unit is composed of office professionals, computer support professionals, classroom paraeducators, health assistants, sign language interpreters, and residency investigators. Are you aware that the Educational Support Professionals, ESPs, have a day dedicated to recognizing their efforts and impact on their involvement with students of Baltimore County? National Education Support Professional Day is annually observed on Wednesday during American Education Week. National Education Support Professional Day honors the contribution of school support employees, their the, these support professionals provide invaluable services and are essential partners in the ch child's educational process. All good intentions aside, this didn't really work out for us because we felt that American Education Week is intended to celebrate the work of uh, that students do in their classroom, not the staff that helps them do it. Thanks to a collaboration between Dr. Dance and ESP, Baltimore County Public Schools ESP Day was moved to the Wednesday before American Education Week. This year, it will fall on November 9th. The Board of Directors of ESPBC would greatly appreciate you publicizing this day through your media in order to remind Baltimore County Public Schools of Educational Support Professional Day. We feel that much attention we feel that such attention would, on this day, increase the morale of our membership. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will move in our public comment speakers. Our first speaker is James Chen. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, my name is James Chen, and um, I'm representing uh, Chinese American Parents Association of uh, Baltimore County. And uh, I'm also a proud father of uh, a cover center, just recognized as uh, one more Blue Ribbon schools in Baltimore County. And we are proposing Baltimore County BOE to recognize the most important Asian holiday, the Lunar New Year. And the holiday has been celebrated by 13 Asian county, con countries and by one-fifth of the world populations. In the past 4,000 years, combining, <clears throat> combining the Lunar New Year Day with one of the BOE's January or February professional, professional development days will give school, will give school age 
Chinese Americans and Asian American kids the precious chance to celebrate not only the holiday, but also the rich Asian traditions. Not only celebrate together with their own parents, but also with their grandparents who may be far away from the country on the other side of the world. I never go to work on Lunar New Year Day, but however, I never had a chance to celebrate at the same time with my, my kids who have to go to school. Lunar New Year Day is not only a holiday for Asian, it's all, almost the holiday right for Asian families to display and ensure the strong love and the, and the support with the family that could pass along generations. I want to love the fact, the affection, the support, and the caring with our big family can be observed and passed on to my generation and the next ones as the invaluable heritage. The BOE's consideration to recognize and to celebrate the Lunar New Year Day on the BOE Professional Development Day will definitely give all Asian family more encouragement to keep their culture, heritage, and, ident and identity in its great con country where diversity has been valued and preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sheila Brown. Uh, Sheila Brown, thank you. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, I'm here as a citizen, as a taxpayer, and as a concerned parent, and as a graduate of Maryland schools. Um, to express my deep outrage and concern about an article that I read on October 4th published in the Baltimore Sun that discusses a disciplinary action that was made private away from the public um, and as it pertains to a teacher whose name I will not state, although I think it should be appropriate to um, under the circumstances. But out of respect for your request, I, instructions, I won't state it. Um, a representative for the um, public school system stated that he could only comment on the disciplinary action or actually on the situation because he received the permission of the teacher to do so. What I find most ironic and absurd about this as it relates to an elementary school um, within the Baltimore County public school systems as it relates to African American children is that the teacher decided to post on her personal social media page just very derogatory, racist, and bigoted images of innocent children who she, on her own camera, appeared to take pictures of using terms like African American Mexican and um, an expletive that I won't mention that begins with the letter A and ends with the letter E as she referred to these students. And as a citizen, I think it is incumbent that this board take action as the body that has the responsibility of terminating um, employees for personnel matters, but also with respect to understanding that this is more than a personnel matter. Anything is a personnel matter when it comes to an employee of public school systems. But this went beyond personnel issues because it involved FERPA, the Family um, Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which provide certain protections for parents and their children so that their educational records, which includes images of those images of children, um, will not be publicly related or published without their permission. This was not an innocent mistake. This was a blatant, deliberate attempt to use her own funny humor to um, impress or um, show some sort of um, 
perverse ideology about her students' race or um, other things that shouldn't even matter. But what I want to urge the board to do is to do a full and comprehensive investigation to see if this is something that has occurred before, to see if it's something that's pervasive and systemic within the school system, and to make the disciplinary action public. After all, it was this teacher who decided to make the children's images public, who uh, violated their rights, and who Thank you, Ms. Brown. Our next speaker is Ying Lin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for their attendance this evening and to express my gratitude towards the dedication of BOE to hearing the thoughts of the parents and children in Baltimore County. My name is Ying Lin, and I'm here today to address the importance of closing BCPS on Lunar New Year, the most important day of the Asian calendar. I speak to you not just as the parents of two BCPS students, but also on behalf of the entire Asian community who celebrate Lunar New Year. On Lunar New Year, my daughters wake up before dawn, excited for the day and what it entails. As a family, we turn on a stream of an annual Lunar New Year festival and celebrate with friends and other relatives, both here and on the other side of the world. But at 7 a.m., we turn off the festivities and hurry to make sure lunches are packed and notebooks are in backpacks so our children make it to school on time. It is a constant struggle between the celebration of heritage and the equally important value of education. Each year, it is the same story. As things currently are, my children are not given the opportunity to fully celebrate their heritage and backgrounds. But this is not just a story of my children. It is the story of the Asian community's children as a whole. 6.8% of BCPS population is of Asian descent, not including mixed-race children, and this figure is only increasing. Of the incoming population of minority students from 2012 to 2014, 19% were Asian American. BCPS is incredibly diverse, and closing schools on Lunar New Year is nothing but a celebration of this diversity, a necessary next step to helping not just children from Asian descent embrace their traditions, but also to allow other students to understand that cherishing this diversity is an important and fundamental part of what makes America, America. I come before you today to ask the Board of Education to follow the examples of Howard County Public Schools and other regions nationwide <coughs> to take action and close schools on Lunar New Year, scheduling professional development days so that they fall on Lunar New Year would also be welcome. The academic year would therefore not need to be shortened in any way, and the time Thank you. Our next speaker is Shuli Zai. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes, Shuli is correct, and Sha is my last name. Sha. Yeah. Good Thank evening, and um, dear honorable BOE members and Dr. Dance. And um, today I'm here to comment on the 2017 and 2018 school calendar. I understand we have this conversation because of Governor Hogan's executive order. So I strongly support to open school before Labor Day. Usually before making any change in public education system, we need to first make sure that changes are beneficial to our kids and families. The main reasons Governor Hogan ordered um, 
of government uh, Maryland school to uh, start uh, after Labor Day are to keep students out of sweltering classroom and to give kids more family vacation time to help local business. I think those reasons are very weak. First of all, thanks for building members' hard work. Baltimore County just agreed to install AC units to busy uh, PS uh, schools that can do not have. So the problem of a uh, sweltering classroom will be taken care of. Second, Governor Hogan assumed that a prolonged summer would promote families to have more vacation time. This would be very true if the working parents' vacation days were also prolonged. But unfortunately, it is not the case, although I wish it well. In fact, prolonged summer will increase financial burden for working parents because they have to, uh, to send their kids to summer camp. To families that cannot afford extra summer camp, prolonged summer can be dangerous for unsupervised children and teens. Studying school after Labor Day will actually damage students' academic, academic performance. You may hear the term summer learning loss. Numerous studies have shown that even with the current school calendar, a few months off in summer can lead to major setbacks in school, including, including loss of knowledge and not test scores. Students with the biggest losses over summer are in already high-risk, low-income groups. Therefore, prolonged summer will further increase academic gap, between, uh, no, achievement, achievement gap between disadvantaged youngs and their peers, so which is against the goal of public education system. <coughs> so with these reasons and many others, so I do hope that BOE consider to keep the current uh, school, schedule, uh, school schedule, which is open the school before Labor Day. Last but not least, I do notice that Governor Hogan released a second executive order to make a seeking a waiver for open school before Liberty even harder. In, a, in case a waiver is not being granted, option C proposed by the calendar committee would be better than B because it gives extra school days for students. We all know that how bad the, the, the winter or in Baltimore County can be, and we all want school have uh, end up with enough days and hours for our kids to, to learn. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Steve Weber. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Dance, I don't know if you recognize my name. You probably should. I hope you do. I've sent you multiple emails. I've hand-delivered a letter to you. Uh, and the issue is, I started, I'm changing my tack here. The issue I started with, what are you doing about schools that are underperforming? Uh, my daughter taught at one, so I know firsthand what's going on. She was a new teacher. After two years, she had to quit. She couldn't do it anymore. And I started to work with you, try to get you to understand what's going on in these schools by saying, what are you doing to address these underperforming schools? And how are you going to... Uh, do you, how do you recognize them, and what are you doing to help them? And I thought you would get at the issues, but I never heard from you or anybody in your staff or anybody in this organization. I can't get people in this organization to respond to it. But I'm changing my tack a little bit because now I'm saying, all right, it's a student behavior issue. I, I thought you would get into it, find that for yourself. You, you must know the issue of student behavior problems in your schools. That's why my daughter left. She could not teach. After two years, she said, said, Dad, I can't do it anymore. And she would go home crying. She was working seven days, 12 hours a day. And, and part was the load that you put on teachers, which is very troubling or very hard to handle for a new teacher. But you throw on top of that the student behavior issues, and they can't do it. She was crying herself to sleep at night. She was threatened, uh, disrespected, cussed at. And this is not really one of the worst schools in your system. So what I'm trying to do is like, what is going on with student behavior issues and who is working to help these schools get this under control? And, and if you all don't know what's going on in your schools, you should be talking to new teachers in the schools. It is a nightmare. And what my daughter would say over and over again, Dad, there's no consequences. These kids act out day in and day out. She would refer them to the principal. They'd be back in the next day doing the same darn thing. Just, and she would say, Dad, there's just no consequences. I can't teach. And she was in a school. And my, what, what I call a challenge school is where 50% or greater of the, of the students are in level one and level two on, the, on your park testing. That's why I say you have a, a, a school that's in trouble. And I can list you out all the schools in your county that are. There's a bunch of them. So if you have schools, 
50% of your students are in level one, level two in park, I think you got problems in that school where t kids are not getting an education. And I think the number one reason is because of student behavior. I think it should be an agenda item on this meeting that you review every month about what is being done and the improvements that are being made. And if you can't, now, then you say, all right, well, where is the student behavior issues coming from? I talked to the good schools that do well in Park. You had a couple of them here, Carver. Parental involvement, that's the key. These schools, they have very good parental involvement. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Our next speaker is Erica Ma. Hello. Hello. I'm here to talk about overcrowding at Hillcrest Elementary School. Oh. Deja vu, anybody? <laughs> That's right, I've done this before. Three years ago, my PTA and I started coming here to talk about overcrowding at Hillcrest. The sad state of the first grade bathrooms, lunches starting at 1045, the inability to have the entire school in an assembly. Three years later, and $10 million, and tens of millions of dollars later, we have two new beautiful schools in Catonsville and one beautiful addition. And I thank you and the county executive for doing that for us. But we also have one sad, dilapidated, still overcrowded school with smelly bathrooms, an AC system that broke down seven times since May, and the inability to have all of the fifth grade in one recital because there are too many people. Hillcrest is nearly 110% overcrowded, still. Yes, there are students who are grandfathering through right now. But even considering those students and those numbers, we would still be over 100%. While the beautiful, newly renovated Canesville Elementary School at Bloomsbury stands at 83%. 83. Why? Because after hours of discussion, and God knows how much money to consultants, when you were supposed to make the hard choices for the best of all the children in our community, you did not. You chose to give into personal, political, social, peer, I don't know what other kinds of pressure. And you failed us. The funniest part of all of this is that my son started Canesville Middle School this year, and that school is now at 118%, and next year will be even higher. And as the surrounding middle schools are all well under 100% capacity, there's no option for renovation or construction. Redistricting is the only solution. But I'm not at here to ask you to do that. Our community was put through anxiety, pain, and a lot of hurt feelings and even tears between neighbors and friends only to create a beautiful, well under capacity school and to keep one over capacity, old decrepit school. If you are not willing to make the hard choices to truly help our community, our community, then please just leave us alone. I know I'm being very harsh and part of me wants to apologize because individually I know each of you are hardworking, dedicated people. But then I think of my children, my children who went to an overcrowded old elementary school my children who will now go to an overcrowded middle school, and then probably to an overcrowded high school. Not because they have to, but because the hard decisions were not made by those who are supposed to make them. So I'm here to ask you to at least, at the very least, renovate Hillcrest Elementary School. Since you're going to leave us overcrowded, the least you can do is to redo the temporary first grade wing that has been temporary for nearly two decades, and give us a new AC system, one that will actually work, since now that we have a heat policy, we have it doesn't fall under there. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker for the evening is Pat Holt. <clears throat> Good evening, Chairman McDaniels. Vice Chair Gellis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board, my name is Pat Holt. I am a teacher with Baltimore County Schools. I'm also a Baltimore County taxpayer, and I have two children that graduated from the Baltimore County School System. There is a theory that runs rampant throughout BCPS. Its perceived results inflict and paralyze both teachers and administrators. If true, this theory is, is toxic and suggests that if a teacher or administrator challenges the popular initiatives of the upper echelons of BCPS, their career status is in jeopardy. 
Many believe that they cannot survive crossing this line, and most absolutely will not. I cannot be one of these fearful ones anymore. Today, I begin my test of this theory. Master grading. This one is near and dear to me. Uh, I have been intrigued with it since I first started to hear about it in 2011, and I implemented it fully into all of my courses that I teach in 2014. I truly believe that this may be the first real move towards educational reform in decades. Unfortunately, it appears to be at its deathbed and will likely die to the inability of those responsible within BCPS for its implementation. So my discussion today is not really about mastery grading. It's about the consistent inability to manage change that results in a constant drain on resources and sucks the energy out of countless principals, teachers, parents, and students. And of course, the students are the ones that ultimately lose. This list of failed efforts is long. Print management, scholarship, infinite campus, BCPS1, most curri curriculum, and now mastery grading, just to name a few. On top of these misfires, we continue to spend hundreds of millions of tax, do tax dollars on the STAT and Lighthouse initiatives with no sound research to support these levels of investment. And the success of these initiatives is questionable, but teachers and administrators run for cover when approached for feedback and scramble to make sure that all looks well when the Lighthouse and STAT experts invade and interrupt the learning environments of classrooms throughout the county. By the tone of my thoughts, you may be led to believe that this is, this is in some way attack on Dr. Dance. If you end up in this place, you are wrong. Dr. Dance has made the vision of BCBS very clear get all of our students college and career ready. Nothing wrong with the vision. Very care, clear with little question. The problem is in implementation. In an era where principals, assistant principals, teachers are being micromanaged and held to extreme levels of accountability, my questions are, is the accountability at the higher levels of administration? Why are they not being called to task for unsatisfactory performance in managing change? Is it not the board's responsibility to look for the answers to these questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holt. Our next uh, agenda item is uh, public comment on proposed 2017-2018 calendar, on the 2017-2018 calendar. And uh, Mr. Holt, you're our, our first speaker. Sorry, I didn't uh, pick up on that. <laughs> Thank you again, and good evening again. Um, in, my, in my review of the three calendar options for the 2017-18 school year that has been placed before you, I, uh, it seems that option A is really not an option in that it starts after Labor Day and will require some type of waiver. Uh, from the state. So with that being said, I would lean towards option C. Uh, the only difference that I seem to see is a one-day difference in the start of school day, and option, B, option C uh, will have us work on, on, on the Jewish holiday on September, September 21st. Uh, this model appears to be most equitable, and that is the one I support. Since I have some time, I would be remiss if I did not make some comments regarding the last board meeting. In my opinion, the demeaning, unprofessional, disrespectful, personal attack that I witnessed uh, at Mr. the Holt, end um, at of this the portion, at, at this portion, I'd like you to uh, keep your comments to the calendar, if you would. When can you I can, make these comments? Uh, in the general public comment portion of our meeting. So I'm censored? Yes. Well, I thought this was America. Uh, thank you. Our um, next speaker is Howard Libet. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Howard Libet. I'm the executive director of the Baltimore Jewish Council. Um, I apologize for not coming to the last meeting when these calendar options were first presented, but you held that meeting on the, for, on the opening night of Yom Kippur. Um, in fact, tonight is the conclusion of another Jewish holiday, which is why there's not a larger attendance from the Jewish community this evening. 
I recognize the challenges you all face with the school calendar for the next year, that what the governor has set. We appreciate it, but I'm here to speak about the Jewish holidays not from a religious perspective, but from operational. I understand that the restrictions you're put under face, you have to make your choices based on how it impact operations in the school system, not about equity or respecting, recognizing one religion or another. And admittedly, the data is a little difficult to come by, right? We don't ask teachers or students what religion you are coming in. So what data do we have that can justify the operational needs? We know that in 2015, on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, nearly 240 teachers took that day off out of, for, religious, for religious reasons. Now, if you know our Jewish community in the Baltimore area, the number of the, the percentage of the Jewish community that would take off the second day, they would be the much more observant members of our community. So realistically, maybe 20%, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. So you're thinking, you're, if you multiply that out, you're talking well over 1,000 teachers in our system are Jewish and would be t looking to take the first day of Rosh Hashanah off. A lot of substitute teachers. Substitute teachers, we know, do a great job, but there's a lot of it. That's a large expense to the school system, to the taxpayers, to keep the schools open that day. And as good as substitute teachers are, we know the level of learning that occurs, it probably isn't of the same quality as when the regular classroom teacher is there. In terms of students, we can look at the most recent census survey by the Associated, which tells you we see more than 12,000 children in Jewish families in Baltimore County, largely in the Northwest, but spreading more and more east of 83 these days as well. I can't tell you how many of them are in the public schools, but clearly a large portion are. If the schools were open on Rosh Hashanah, you would see a large, large absences, particularly in a concentrated number of schools. Again. If you're keeping the schools open on that holiday, there's a lot of lost learning going on for kids because kids are going to stay home. I'll be the first to admit the data is far from perfect. Nevertheless, I think the data is that there's enough there to tell you that for operational reasons, the Baltimore County schools should continue to remain closed for students and teachers on the Jewish holidays. And for next year's calendar, that means keeping them, open, keeping them closed on Rosh Hashanah. Thanks. I'm happy to work with anyone from the school system who might want to talk more about the data at a separate time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our, our uh, next agenda item is retirements. Uh, I'm mean, sorry, it's new business personnel matters. And for that, uh, call forth Dr. Maya. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, and resignations. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, do I have a motion to approve exhibits G1 and G2? I move. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion at this time? If not, uh, Ms. Causey. Um, I just want, under some of the categories that we see, um, I just wanted to ask, how many, do we have any openings for bus attendants? Yes, we do. Approximately how many? Roughly five. And for our bus drivers? Roughly 45. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abs and one abstention, the motion carries. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Mayor. Our next item is new business action taken in closed session. Uh, Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening, thank you. Earlier this evening, the board considered four appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. These four were considered on the record as there was no request made for oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in that closed session in those four matters, which are summary affirmance numbers 6, 17, I'm sorry, hearing examiner numbers 17-06, 17-08, 17-14, and 17-15. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. The motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Nussbaum. Um, most of the orders have been signed, but there's one order that had to be revised, so it's over there on the desk, so if people can make sure to sign it. Thank you. All right. 
Our next item on the agenda is new business contract awards. Um, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Gillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Building and Contract Committee met earlier and discussed uh, contract items I-1 through I-7. Uh, the, inf the informal vote of the committee uh, was to uh, unanimously recommend items 2 through 7 for approval, and the vote was 2 to 1 to recommend for approval item 1. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Uh, I would ask then for a motion to approve items I-1 through I-7. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Oh, I don't need a second. Okay. <laughs> Is there any discussion at this time? Ms. Causey? I would like to separate, separate out item I-1 since it was not approved similarly as the others. All right. Well, separate I-1. Then... Uh, I'll ask for a motion to accept items I-2 through I-7 at this time. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. All right. And now we have item one. Do I have a motion to accept item one? So moved. It's been moved. Okay. Uh, and there's a discussion. Ms. Causey? Did you? It's been moved, and so we, we will discuss it at this time. If I could ask Mr. Saris um, to please clarify, the, the contract is for an extension, and I just wanted it clarified about how much was spent in, um, it was said that it was spent 3,300,000 in three years and six months, and then this estimate is 4 million for future five years. Just uh, clarify for us how much has been spent and if that was in the correct time frame that I mentioned. And then with the funding, um, is that how long was the original contract? Because that's not listed here. And are the expenditures at a faster pace than that original estimate? Yeah, the original contract was approved on October 11. Uh, 2011 for a period of five years and we are requesting that we extend it um, through 2021 as listed and the year-to-date expenditures of 3.3 million are provided there or the contract to date expenses excuse me So the original contract was for five years for $4 million. Correct. Um, but we're and spending. So this spending has taken place over that basically five years, right? So Since 2011. Since 2011. So it's under $1 million a year. Correct. So are you increasing the per annum amount, contract amount, moving forward? Well, no. If we were, we would have made that recommendation under estimated modification amount. So we're leaving it at $4 million as original and just requesting that we extend the life of the contract for the five years. So it would be four million additional in spending authority, no. or you're saying it's only going to be seven hundred thousand in spending authority. Correct. So it would only be seven hundred thousand spending authority until 2021. Correct. Now, is that lower per annum rate because we've been wrapping up some large projects, so we won't need as much moving forward? Well, this is school-based spending primarily, um, and so I don't know. You know, it's possible that schools uh, are spending differently uh, as technology needs change. Um, possible that, you know, because we're providing, although I don't know why providing one-to-one -one devices would affect this, I think what may be is that um, schools no longer have the burden of providing a lot of other technology that they once did. Um, and that may affect their spending patterns, but this really has nothing to do with STAT from a programmatic standpoint. Okay, and the, the
the separation of operating budget and capital budget, how much of the remaining 700000 in spending authority is coming from operating versus what is capital? Uh, well, of the $3.3 million, um, about 800000 uh, or about 25 percent was capital expenditures. So if we extrapolate, it would be 25 percent of 700,000. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on uh, item I? Is it I one? Yes. Yes, uh, Mr. Yoffa. I'm making an understanding. Based on the items that are illustrated here, that are covered by this contract, what would be considered a capital item? Well, when we open a new school, some of these expenses that are in, you know, like if we install a, studio, a TV studio at a new school, okay. that's a fairly costly item. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any other discussion? If not, all those in favor of item I-1, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Our next uh, item is new business, uh, a report on policies. Uh, first reading, and I'll turn that over to Ms. Williams. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, the Policy Review Committee has reviewed uh, the policies that are presented to you for first reader on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit J. The committee is recommending that policies 0100, 0200, uh, 5551, and 8131 be moved forward for second reader. The committee is moving policy 5610 forward without a recommendation. And I also want to just share publicly that PRC will be re-reviewing re 0100 um, while it's in the second reader stage. We do note that there is some inconsistency. And I'm going to ask Ms. Prumo, I, I realize that I've approved the agenda for PRC already. If it's not gone out, I'd like it, that to be added so that we can at least PRC, at least revisit uh, the issue with the definitions. Um, so I wanted to state that for the record. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, do, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved. Okay, it's moved. Uh, is there any discussion at this time? Um, Ms. Johnson. Yes, I just wanted to um, commend the PRC and hopefully the Board when we approve this that we're adding gender identity, including gender expression, um, to um, it under item 1C. And a lot of the equity conferences I've been to recently, this is a very big issue and it goes on years or, well, what I've seen years in other, other counties. And to be able to bring this forward and um, be proactive rather than reactive is really impressive. Thank you. Ms. Bratt, did you have a comment? Um, yes, about oh, policy 0100. Um, I did have a question about the, one of the changes made. It's under uh, guidelines. I believe it's E, and it says recruit and increase participation of persons from underrepresented groups in school programs, which was changed from advanced academics. And I was wondering if the intention behind that was to um, stop the, the practice, I guess, of pushing students who are not necessarily prepared into classes for the sake of increasing numbers. Was that the ideology behind changing it, or? Can I ask Ms. Promote? She would address your question. To answer your question, no. It is okay. not the intent to push um, or to encourage students who are not prepared to enter special programs. But we widened it from advanced academics to any school program because we do want to have students who are underrepresented in those programs. But they must be prepared. And if they need extra resources as equity, as we all know what the equity definition is, then we would provide those extra resources so they would be prepared to enter special programs. And outside the policy, do you know if there's any any check on um, the students who are being placed into these programs for the sake of increasing diversity within these classes? Because I do know that some people have spoken to me about problems of students being pushed into classes that they're not prepared for, for the sake of the numbers that the school has to present on diversity. 
I'm or is that not, outside the policy? I'm not sure I can answer that question without more specifics. Okay. And I would ask that if there are other specific questions that you put them in writing and submit them to us and PRC can address them um, more appropriately at that time. I think we have to be careful just assuming that children from unrepresented groups are the ones that aren't able to learn. Exactly. So what we're doing again in this policy is making sure that we equitably are educating all of our students throughout the county. So whether you're in an AP class, which we learned earlier from our students from the SGA, they're getting a large amount of rigor, which they deserve, <laughs> but they're also getting, um, they're having conversations in class and they're, they're, doing, they're doing interactive um, activities in the classrooms. Then the other class, the students that weren't necessarily in AP, stu AP students weren't having the same open dialogue, weren't having the same level of, of um, I don't know, just informed discussions. They were given a book and a piece of paper to fill out. So what's important within this policy is to make sure that all of our students, underrepresented or not, are getting um, an equitable education. Right. Thank you. And again, just for this, I, I would like to reiterate what Ms. Williams said. Any board members that have thoughts on any of these policies, please communicate that to the PRC so that they can incorporate that in the second reader as we look forward. All right. Any other discussion at this time? If not, um, all those in favor of, moving, of the, uh, supporting the PRC recommendation, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, we're uh, at uh, uh, board member comments at this time. I think I started to the right the last time. I'll start with Mr. Stewart tonight. So good evening. Um, wanted to share a few comments tonight uh, about well, we've, we've all heard about the challenges our system is facing, and there are many, but we've also had some successes that we've been able to celebrate recently, and that included over the course of the last uh, week and a half, two weeks, three ribbon cuttings in the southwest area, which are reflective of a massive investment made by our county uh, and our state um, in our community to try to change the school landscape um, in one big sweep, and it was significant. We saw the energy and the excitement uh, of the children and the parents and the staff and so on. Uh, doesn't mean that work can't be done, but needs to be done with the community. And so um, I would always encourage an open dialogue, particularly with the parent tonight and anyone else who's concerned. I think that there are still improvements to be made. Uh, but we do them because we're representatives of the people. And so we do them in community and we do them with one another. Um, I also look forward to continuing the conversation regarding uh, Lansdowne High School as that continues to come to the fore. But, uh, board members, I wanted to also let you know that you'll be receiving a report from the ad hoc committee, um, folks who worked very tirelessly to um, try to address our operational um, opportunities uh, as a board. And so I'd encourage you to review, and uh, I look forward to having a conversation with you about how we can um, make it even better on this board and, and make our uh, performance uh, a little bit more effective, because after all, we only have really one go around as far as we know uh, in this life and certainly our time is limited on this board so I look forward to doing good work with you and finally I want to say congratulations to my sister who had a baby today. Uh, thank you Mr. Stewart. Ms. Eaton. Thank you. <clears throat> today the board was given a presentation on the renovation of Patapsico High School and the Center for the Arts. The plans look great especially the new entrance, the new library, media center. And let's not forget about the air conditioning. I only wish that the renovation took overcrowding into consideration. With that being said, I am looking forward to seeing the completed project. Thank you to Mr. Dixit and Mr. Smith for all their hard work. Thank you, Ms. Eaton. Ms. Williams. Good evening, everyone. I just want to say thank you to all of my board members, um, Dr. Dance and BCPS staff for your well wishes during my recent injuries. I am sorry that I was not able to attend our last board meeting. Um, there were several area meetings and ribbon cuttings I had hoped to be able to attend but was not able to. Um, I am on the mend and um, I hope to continue to be a valued and valuable board member. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kazi. 
Good evening. I just wanted to go over a few um, things that were going on this week. Um, I also attended uh, with uh, Mr. Stewart and other uh, board members, the Westtown Elementary School ribbon cutting, a brand new school uh, based on the design of Lions Mills. So a great effort by our uh, facilities and operation folks. Uh, also a, a good use of the planning money and design money already spent on Lions Mill to, uh, to do another elementary school based on that. It was great to see such excitement of students, teachers, parents, and administrators. And as uh, Superintendent Dance said, buildings do matter. Uh, next, at the October 17th Policy Review Committee, as you heard, we've covered a lot of ground and brought forward uh, many policies to be considered. Uh, we also want to, I just did want to say that uh, it was also decided that Policy 6202 is being re-evaluated re to include social media usage by teachers. Um, and also a uh, revised opt-out form for our parents in being able to um, uh, more completely uh, control their students' digital privacy. Um, these policy review committee meetings are always open to the public. Um, also, the Northeast Area Education Advisory Council pre-budget meeting, and they'll be sharing their community's concerns. I was also privileged to attend the annual awards ceremony for Baltimore County Commissions on Disabilities, and it's very inspirational to see the wonderful work and volunteers making a difference in the lives of those with disabilities, including a student from um, Perry Hall Middle School, she was just delightful, and uh, despite uh, vision impairment, she has gone on to do wonderful things. Uh, and if you go on the website, uh, there'll be a, uh, a statement about her. Also, the, a teacher recognized for her work uh, with students that have disabilities, Pamela Satterley-Williams, that was wonderful. And also, there was a group, a family advocate category, and they created a group, I want to say it was 50 years ago, by their side. So for families that have children uh, with significant disabilities, they might want to look that up if they have a website. Um, also, Central Area Advisory Council, there were discussions on overcrowding, and the Towson High School parents want a replacement school, and they're trying to figure out ways to understand um, how the facilities uh, decisions are made. Um, also, the curriculum committee meeting I was able to attend where a lot of time was spent on the grading and reporting, and I'll discuss more about uh, that in a minute. On October 22nd, I was glad to be at Delaney High School for the high school homecoming parade, and then they also, um, they have an amazing marching band that uh, performed in that. Also at Delaney was held the Cross Country County Championships for middle and for high school, and it's always great to see our student athletes compete, giving tremendous effort and showing great sportsmanship, especially when Delaney girls beat the Hereford High School girls by one point. Congratulations to everyone that ran their best. Um, also at the uh, October 24th Northeast Advisory meeting, they had another special session called Safety and Technology. And I wanted to thank all the BCPS staff that come out in the evening to uh, collaborate with community. Um, it was very helpful, really informative. The parents there were really very grateful. Uh, there was a lot of good news shared by Ryan Embriali, Jim Corns, Fran Glick, Christina Byers, and Sue Han. The work of keeping our children safe in this digital world that is coming and will not stop is very important. And it was good to hear the uh, the improvements that are being made. And bottom line, there is a great deal of effort to wrap our arms around all the issues of digital safety for our students and staff, but I'm encouraged about what is being done. There is more work to do, and there are dedicated people doing it, and they do want to hear from the community. Um, also, I attended at Hereford High School Counseling Department arranged for a presentation by a Johns Hopkins doctor on identifying anxiety and depression in adolescents. Uh, it was very well attended. About 100 parents, staff, and community members were in attendance. And uh, Hereford High School is considering putting it on during the school day for the students. It was such an informative and well-presented um, information. So they also have an app which, talking to our parents and students and about what we can do in our digital world, um, that does increase awareness about facts but also resources that are available. And you can get it from an app store and it's called M-A-D-A-P. So that's the letter M, the letter A, the letter D, the letter A, the letter P. I downloaded it and it's really uh, quite a nice app to have. Um, 
That sadly is an appropriate introduction to the next remarks about grading and reporting procedures, pilot program implementation. As we've heard some comments tonight and the board members heard at our dinner from our student uh, representatives, our student leaders, um, that there's a lot of uh, concerns that are going on. First, uh, a question that's come up is how is it a pilot program when program changes the grading and reporting for virtually all grades, all courses, all students, all teachers, and all schools? I was informed it is a pilot, as TABCO indicates in their remarks, because teachers cannot be held responsible for it in their evaluations. And given the controversial implementation with limited training time for teachers, I believe the teachers should not have their evaluations based on it. The school administration teams were only given the manual and training on June 21 at the Leadership Academy. Teachers were already gone for the summer. Teachers did not receive training on with the new manual in front of them until late August. So no wonder TABCO calls it a confused implementation. With that said, why are students being held accountable for it if it is in fact a pilot program? There's tremendous concern, complaints, questions that have been received in emails, phone calls, petition to rescind the new procedures that includes over 1,400 signatures. And many of the comments talk about uh, the students being heartbroken with anxiety and depression about dropping grades as they uh, are planning to apply to colleges or careers. For our high school students especially, grades on their transcript are mission critical. What appears to be happening may close some gaps. Some people have said that it's about closing the gaps but not in a way that is actually helpful to students. It seems the harder classes are being made even harder, so students' grades are falling, and that's a vast complaint. The advanced placement classes are taught by teachers, and in a different point, advanced placement classes are taught by teachers certified by the college board. So how is it appropriate for them to be told days before school starts they need to change how they are grading and reporting in this nationally standardized class? Uh, it's all, there's also been feedback about 50 is the new zero, being very controversial. Students that are struggling will get a higher final grade than their ability and hide problems that should be addressed. Um, when we've had our dinner conversation with the students, it was made very important that there should not be grade inflation. I don't see how 50 is the new zero, and many folks have said that, how that doesn't add to grade inflation. So the top students may drop in their academic success and struggling students will be passed along. That's not equity, that is not excellence, that is not what any student or parent wants or deserves. So I'm pleased with the conversation that we also had at dinner where the steering committee under Ms. White is making recommendations to the superintendent. So hopefully they fully address the problems, including how to correct the errors in the first marking period. So with that, good night everyone, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Yofelder? Yes, thank you. I wanted to say how, um, how much joy we have every year in having dinner with our student leaders. Uh, it, it's always surprising to me uh, that our student leaders do not hesitate to say exactly what's on their mind. And uh, I'm very encouraged by that because uh, that, that's an opportunity to, for us uh, to hear unfiltered comments directly from uh, the babe's mouth. So uh, I do appreciate I hope that we have some opportunity in the future either to uh, increase the amount of time that we spend with the students, uh, either at the, the two meetings we now have, or to actually increase the number of meetings. It was a great event. Thank you. Thank you, and I would echo the same comments. I, I just want to mention briefly that I did attend the Northwest Area Council pre-budget meeting, and um, they're going to be issuing some suggestions, but uh, their message too was they would like to hear from the board and system uh, as to whether the suggestions will be adopted or not. That, that's something that we have to be sure we follow through on from the, all the advisory committees getting them feedback as to whether the sex, uh, suggestions will be followed. And lastly, again, to echo what Mr. Stewart said before, the board members leave tonight, you'll get a package with a report from the ad hoc committee on ways to make our meeting efficient. We'll be talking about that at our November 9th meeting, so you have a couple weeks to look over what's in the package and be prepared to uh, discuss it at our next meeting. So, thank you. Mr. Gillis. Thanks. Uh, if our student leaders are a reflection on our entire student population, which I'm sure they are, uh, we have a lot to be proud of. Those, uh, uh, those uh, people with whom we spent an hour earlier today are really, uh, are really talented, uh, special uh, people. And uh, I thank all of you uh, who are responsible for teaching them every day. Thanks. Ms. Bratt. Um, 
Hi, I'd just like to thank um, all of BCPS staff and the rest of the board members for their very clear direction as to where they want to take the grading policy. I appreciate that there were a lot of concerns, but it does seem like from what we're hearing from the staff that there are clear recommendations that are going to go out to administrators, executives, and teachers, which makes me really hopeful about the direction um, and how this is all being handled. Um, and then I would also like to thank the rest of the board members for taking time to meet with the rest of BCS. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it's very timely that we would get, be getting a report on uh, board efficiency. I want you all to know that the board meetings will become increasingly more efficient beginning the first meeting in December. Uh, uh, however, uh, having said having said that, I do want to uh, I do want to acknowledge the fact that uh, it has been a privilege to be a member of the board for the last five and a half years, and I am very uh, grateful for the opportunity. I'm also uh, Although if I realized all the meetings would be ending by 8 o'clock or very close to that, I may have reconsidered my decision not to seek reappointment. But uh, seriously, though, I made a decision not to actively seek reappointment. I had no assurances that I would be reappointed if I sought it. However, that never stopped me from seeking things, as you all know. I do want to thank Governor Hogan for his kind and generous remarks to me relative to my service on the board. And I want to congratulate him and thank him for his choice of Julie Hen to be my replacement. Julie is the current uh, chairman or president, I'm not sure the title, of the Northeast Area Advisory Council. She will be a wonderful board member. She will be very dedicated and she will be very sincere. I've spoken with her since her appointment and we're going to be meeting as well um, to exchange ideas. But uh, I will tell her to be, work very hard to carry on the tradition of being verbose on behalf of the at-large member from uh, the eastern part of the county. But I do want to commend the governor on, on, on his appointment and thank him again for his kind words to me. I think also the appointment of Julie does continues the trend of, of moving our board uh, in a good direction. I think it is good to have younger people on the board, and um, I think the governor made some very wise appointments last year when the board became uh, younger and a little bit more diverse as far as uh, uh, not just age but also gender. However, I do want to observe, and this is not directed to the governor, but I do want to observe that we have a necessity, and I hope the electorate in the election of 2018, plus the commission that will be recommending appointees to be at large members will keep in mind the fact that, yes, age diversity is good, gender diversity is good, but we also need more ethnic and racial diversity on the board. Uh, it is important to have the Board of Education look more like Baltimore County uh, schools than it currently does. Uh, this is not certainly a reflection on anybody who was on the board. Obviously, I've served proudly for five and a half years, and I've served with all of you during all or part of that time. And I think that uh, all the members are dedicated and sincere. But I do think we, we, we have some work to do relative to uh, a little bit more on the diversity side of our board membership. So. Uh, I'll be at the next two meetings, no guarantees of how long they will last, <laughs> but uh, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. And once again, I want to thank the governor and congratulate him on, on his choice of my replacement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collin. Thank you. I really rubbed off on Michael with this whole equity thing. I'm so proud of myself. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to thank a few people. Um, first of all, Ms. Byers and Ms. White, I was, as I was visiting schools throughout the last week or week and a half or so, um, I would be in the school talking to a teacher and get some really great ideas or had a question about the LS versus the IN and would get um, immediate responses so I could, at, so I could get answers back to the, to the students and to the teachers. And there were so many great teachers out there really 
actually using the policy. And like I said in the meeting prior, there's a lot of teachers that are already using the policy. Um, but it needs to be tweaked, and I'm an appreciative of the steering committee um, and staff and um, all the stakeholders who have given their input and, and been able to help hopefully change this policy for, for even further for the better. Um, additionally, I want to thank, uh, or I want to let people know about the Northwest Advisory Commit or meeting that is that's happening tomorrow evening um, at Milford Mill High School from seven to eight, and that is really going to be talking about the um, grading and reporting policy. So everybody's invited, no matter uh, what part of the county you live in. We also have the PTA Council um, at Pikesville High School. So if you haven't seen Pikesville High School yet, come by. It's a beautiful school from six to nine thirty, and that's on Thursday. And then on November 15th is another discussion during the curriculum committee, the, which is an open meeting um, at the uh, admin building from 4.30 to 6 about the grading and reporting policy. And then feel free, again, all the parents and, and, and um, a few students who have reached out to me by email with questions, concerns, a lot of concerns about the policy. I just want to thank you and, and uh, keep those questions coming. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Birch. Mr. Chairman, I would echo um, Senator Collins' comments with regard to the importance of diversity on our board. I think the board's verbosity, diversity, will take a tremendous hit in a few meetings. Um, but I'm sure we'll be gaining uh, with, uh, with Julie Henn significantly. And I think in the balance, it may be a net advantage. Um, secondly, I would just say that uh, I had the uh, opportunity to tour our Golden Ring Middle School. And there were a lot of good things happening at that school. I toured it with uh, Senator uh, Kathy Klausmeyer. Um, just some of the things that, one of the things that are, that, that, that's good about the school, uh, we came back on Wednesday. We were there on Monday of last week and came back on Wednesday for Art for a Cause, which was an event held in the evening. It was a tremendous success. Art teacher uh, Camille Gibson and other staff and students, um, it, it really uh, promoted art and um, um, breast cancer cancer awareness, and uh, if the event is repeated, I would certainly recommend that, 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 that all attend. There's more work to be done at our Golden Ring Middle School, and I've uh, followed up uh, in, some, in some ways with our superintendent as well as uh, our facilities folks, but we have more to do there. Um, I've attended a number of our uh, Education Advisory Council meetings, including the Northwest. I followed Chuck after Chuck had left. I stopped over there at Milford Mill Academy, and I was at the Central uh, Education Advisory Council meeting uh, over at uh, uh, Carver, the Carver Center. I went to the Northeast Educational Advisory uh, meeting, and I was at the Southeast uh, just, uh, I want to say, last night. And uh, it's interesting to see the volunteers and to hear their comments with regard to a variety of issues, including the work that needs to be done on our schools to continue to improve and move them forward. Uh, like many board members, I've received emails from parents uh, about uh, the new grading policy. And uh, one of the reoccurring themes is the uh, anxiety in some cases related to the new uh, policy. Uh, I had the opportunity to follow up with Ferlita White, our chief academic officer, and I just met tonight, in fact, with Dr. Hope Baer, who is uh, the head of our, our guidance uh, efforts in our schools. And to the extent there are any families where there's a student that uh, is experiencing uh, anxiety, whether it be related to the grading policy or for other reasons, please know there are resources at our schools, and they are there for our students to um, take advantage of. Uh, we want our students to do well, and uh, we try to create an environment where they can succeed and do well. And I thank Dr. Baer for taking the time to meet with me. Uh, going forward, uh, American Education Week is just on the horizon. I want to thank a number of principals who were kind of to take my call, however busy they may have been. Uh, and I'll be hitting some of the schools in my district, our sixth district, including some of our Title I schools and some of our other schools where there are, there are challenges for all of us. So that's um, my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Birch and all board members this evening. We'll finish up this evening with there's just a few announcements. Um, schools, will be, schools and offices will be closed on Election Day, Tuesday, November uh, 8th. And related to that, our next board meeting will be on Wednesday, which is an unusual day, but Wednesday, November 9th at 7 p.m. here at Greenwood. I would remind board members to don't leave without your package with the ad hoc committee report. And uh, with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.